Well, welcome to the Stone Road and Podcast. It's the one you don't want to miss. It stars Greg Reed, the Stone Roadie, and Rip the Rocket Scientist. Let's not forget Kathy Gotti and all the old friends come along. Lord Willie, Talkin' Skinner, and leaving you with a song. Podcast 93, action. All righty then, looky here, looky here. This is podcast 93 of the Stone Roadie Show. And my name is Craig Reed, the Stone Roadie, and this is my co-host, the rocket scientist, Griff Martin. And our special guest today is one of my favorite friends on the on the on the uh, Leonard Skinner airplane crash, my friend, the survivor, Mark Frank, and he was our one of our guests on podcast fourteen on the Stone Roadie Show. How you doing today, Mark Frank? I'm doing good, still above ground, and glad to be here, and glad to be on the show. All righty, yeah. Mark said he wanted to come on and 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 say give some thanks for the people that have been contributing funds to the Forgotten Survivors funds, and I'm just going to pass this on over to my co-host, the rocket scientist Griff Martin. So take it away, Griff. Yeah, it's always great to have a uh, plane crash survivors on here. You know, they uh, they're 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 what it's all about, and we appreciate Mark coming on. Uh, a little background on Mark Frank: uh, he was a drum tech for Artemis Pyle, and uh, he was on the last tour in '77 with Leonard Skinner, and uh, he was on the plane when it went down, and he was one of the guys that walked away from the plane and went for help with Kenny Peden and Artemis Pyle. And uh, we've heard uh, stories about that little adventure, Uh, but we're not going to go into that. Uh, I think mainly uh, what Mark wants to do is, is come on this podcast and, and thank everyone for uh, their contribution uh, to the survivors that everybody that's donated money, everybody that's, that came out to the rockin' for a reason event, uh, and, and met Mark. And he just was really humbled by the fact that people were so, uh, helpful to, uh, to the cause. So, uh, Mark's here and he's, uh, he's also going to legitimize some stuff for Craig and I, because, you know, there's a little bit of controversy out there that Craig and I aren't a legit, legitimate, which, you know, even though we've had a picture of Leslie Hawkins <laughs> taking a check and now we got Mark Frank here, but uh yeah so hey mark how you doing man how you been doing lately i'm doing good i can't complain you know about anything and like i said i must start off like i said a while ago thinking you and craig were getting this started and then it go along uh you know there's, all, there's a lot of people i like to think and i want to put a face on where people's money is going to. I want them to be able to see somebody, you know, and uh, uh, we'll kind of go from from there. You know. Yeah, and you know, let me, I think, let me uh, hey Griff, let me let me run. Through. I didn't get a chance to make okay. the screen up that I normally have over here with the the contributors, and I sorry I didn't get a chance to go check my mail today, so I didn't make up a new new screen over mm-hmm. here, but. Uh, yeah, we had uh, uh, a, a fellow named uh, Kenneth Kenneth Maines. He sent he sent a doggone donation. He I I went back and see the dated the check, and he would have been our third donator. And he he wrote me and he goes, "Hey Craig, I wrote I I, I donated a hundred dollars, and you never cashed the check, you know." So he said, "I I, I sent you a book." He's a uh, investigator. Uh, he's a um, Oh God! What do you want to call it? Uh, he does. Uh, 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 oh, I'll, uh, anyway, he sent me a book, and it's a, a crime that are uh, unknown. Uh, 
Uh, oh, what, whatever. I'll, I'll, I'll get it here in a minute. I should, I should have prepared for this. My, my, my dog got electricity went out. We, we've been messing around with doing this and and uh, messing around with my. We got thunderstorms here. So, anyways, yeah, Kenneth Maines. He, he sent sent a hundred bucks. So, and uh, um, and guy who just wanted to buy name by identified by Brad sense. He sent he sent us another a uh, hundred dollar donation and and i think we've gone ever over everybody since that since uh oh, our last donation tim manny he he sent us 25 bucks here that i think that was our last donator here last last um last time we did a podcast but you know um we did sell that guitar we sold that uh leonard skinner commemorative guitar last week and there was a little bit of an issue with that somebody bid uh, a little over two thousand dollars for it and then and then canceled their bid and i went you know somebody was was playing with that to find out where the the top bidders top bid is you know and then they then they pulled their bid you know so so I yeah it went back to like fifteen hundred buck fifteen something and fifteen fifty, and then I saw there was action on it, and I just I just wasn't really wasn't paying attention. And then the next morning I get up and I see it's nineteen hundred bucks. And then I look at my email, and it's the person that bid two thousand dollars and pulled their bid and canceled because they say they lost their job, that that won it. And then they said, and then they, they said, Rip sent me a message and just said, I don't know how that happened. I pulled my bid and I woke up this morning and they said that I'd won the guitar. Well, what would be fair would just be to give it to the second, the second, uh, give it, uh, make it a second chance offer. And I goes, wait a minute. There was bids on that thing after you closed. The only way your name would have got in there is if you had a bid on it. Oh, no, 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 I didn't bid on it again. So I called eBay and I asked them. They said, yeah, just minutes before the guitar closed, they they pulled their cancellation of the, they, they uh, pulled their cancellation. So that made them the high bidder. So and then I don't know why they did it. They intentionally screwed up the auction and then wanted me to pass it to the second chance and you know and that makes it look like we're we've got people out there that are bidding high on it and trying to uh, p- get people to overbid on it because that's you know 1875 is a lot of money for a, a an epiphone um guitar but it's you know it's commemorative and it's you know it's a little bit special so but uh Luckily, my second, um, the second high bidder is a, a real loyal customer customer of mine, uh, William and Cindy. I won't mention their last name, but they uh, this morning took me up on my my second chance offer and saved me from having to uh, um, uh, relist the guitar. But you know, I still. Still need to, uh, to clarify what happened there because the whole thing just looked shaky. You know, I mm-hmm. I even thought it looked shaky, like because I you know I sell things on eBay and I I have people that even even tell me you know I I bid on it just to get the bids up. I goes don't do that. You know you'll get stuck with it. Just don't don't do that. You know so you know but uh, this this that's not what this person did they intentionally overbid on it and knew what they were doing and then said oh i don't know how that happened but um you know luckily it was uh, my my uh, the second chance bidder was a a loyal customer of mine so uh, we took care of that but anyways we ended up last week with having an overflow of um of uh, uh three thousand dollars and we needed another two thousand dollars to uh to get to the five thousand so we could give everybody another thousand dollars so uh the, t- the guitar sold for 1875 
But by the time um, I got to pay fees on it and everything, we'll end up with about sixteen seventy five, and that's not even probably including the the taxes they'll hit me with. But we'll worry about that later. And then with this hundred dollars we 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 just got here, we ended up with fourteen ninety. So that's close enough to fifteen thousand uh, uh, to to five more thousand dollars because we've totally we've we've uh, we've collected 15 grand now and uh, we gave I, I was kind of confused last week uh, as to our totals I was trying to think the first 500 donate dollar donations we gave to the first four recipients I was kind of I thought they were thousand dollar donations but I got confused but yeah they were the first the first two were five five hundred dollar donations so so yeah, we we've given everybody. Um, uh, well, then 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 we got then we collected uh, five thousand dollars from from rocking for a reason that that yeah we came up for another five thousand there. So yeah, we we've collect, we've, collect, we've collected fifteen grand. So we've been able to give five five people. We're we're going to send out another thousand uh, dollars this week to five recipients so that's uh you know it's 15 grand we're, we've sent out as of this week so that's that's pretty good you know we're you know oh. we just started doing this about what three months ago so and mark i think you you maybe you can add to that and say how how you've appreciated that uh, that money yeah well that was the whole thing you know when i first mentioned this degree it was People have been sending in money, and we had to rock them for a reason. I, I like that. But, no, you know, I'm sure they'd be curious on who, where the money's going, you know. So I have no problems coming over here and thanking you and Griff, Chad, and everybody that took the time to send money in. I mean, it's not going notice, you know. I mean, and whatever comp what, money I have received, I've been very grateful for. And when it came down to Jacksonville, 30 and George, rocking for reason. I know a lot of people there in Jacksonville took the time, you know, bought tickets. And as over the last week or two, I became friends with a couple of people that not only attended the show, the concert at Rock for a Reason, but they were willing to drive hundreds of miles. There was three people from his name is Steve Head, his brother, and another friend drove from Athens, Georgia to Jacksonville, <clears throat> which, you know, that's 300 something miles, a uh, six hour drive, you know, give or take some there and back. So, not only did they think, you know, a lot of people spent a lot of time and money to come to that show, you know, so it was very grateful. Everybody, myself, like I said, I'm kind of stumbling around. Me, Mark Howard, I don't know what's his name up his damn uh, natural. Gene Odom and Paul Welch. You know? Yeah. Me and Paul both of had strokes last week. Love me. Every one of us are greatly preaching. Yeah, there is no doubt about it. Uh, the money has been comforting. I've used some of it to <laughs> keep, my, keep my car up. And I've taken some and just put it up. It just feels good to have extra money. And all of us owe y'all and everybody in here a big old thank you. And there's a little background on some of these guys that are are dealing with things uh, like Mark Howard right now. Uh, yeah. he's, he's in the hospital and he's struggling with trying to save his leg. And, and, you know, uh, he's very appreciative. I talk to him, you know, uh, when he's not in the hospital and he's, but right now he's going through a lot. So you guys keep that in mind. Uh, Mark, Mark Howard is, is really struggling right now. He's in the hospital. He's got some issues with his leg. He's, He's trying to save it. It's not looking good. Uh, and Mark Frank, he's he's had a stroke, and he's a, sort of an advocate for people with strokes. And 
So that's his cause, uh, and uh, he's dealing with that uh, every day of his life. And you know, uh, Paul Welch, Paul Welch, you know, he's he's got a lot of issues as well. He's you know he's unable to walk very well, and 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 he's got some physical issues, and all these things are contributors you know to from what happened from that plane crash so uh you know it's time these guys got some help and they never ask for anything they none of them ask for anything they don't most of the time and and like kenny peden you couldn't even get kenny peden to take any money you know and the poor guy now we lost kenny peden mm -hmm. and uh he's one of the guys that went for help with Mark Frank, uh, and, and Artemis. And, uh, you guys did a trek through the woods, a heroic trek through the woods. And, uh, you know, that was, that was quite a, quite a feat for a couple, for three guys that, that were in a plane crash and going through a swamp and in, in the dark, you know, and not even really sure where they were going. So, uh, you know, uh, you got something to say, Mark? I was just saying, actually, Artemis did a good job getting us out. Now, me and Kenny were, you know, behind Artemis as we'd come up, and we were just sort of, sort of almost like zombie walking. I mean, it took a while for us to kind of get our faculties as we were coming out. But don't get me wrong, if I had to describe it, it was my darkest night, you yeah. know. And uh, so, like I said, yeah, Art did a good job getting us out. And whatever happened after that, we, me and Kenny were already at the hospital. And I, and I remember talking to you, Mark, because we had several conversations, you know, and, and you were saying, and, and I kind of can relate to this, because uh, a blunt, blunt force trauma, if, if you never experienced that, it creeps up on you. I mean, and you said you were like in bed for a month, right? Mark, you felt like you just couldn't even move. You know? Well, I had, you know, a cerebral contagion, not near as bad as Paul did. <laughs> and, uh, but if you back up at 77, they were all considered, let's say, pretty much concussions. <laughs> now, if we had that crash, it would be traumatic brain injury. And there would be a lot of us that have survived that crash that did have, you know, uh, brain trauma. And so, I mean, faced with the, the, the fact that you just went through a plane crash and then what I, from my perspective is it became something that nobody wanted to talk about because it was such a horrible thing. You had, you know, some folks that died, some really important folks in the band that died. And then you had a lot of people, you know, that, that were, uh, injured and things like that. And it's, it's almost like, you know, you just didn't want to talk about it because it, it wasn't a, it, it wasn't a popular topic and that went on for up until now. And so, you know, these guys are getting up in their years are retired, you know, they're, they're struggling with their health and, and it's time to help. And there's so many people out there that want to help them and they understand that. And they thought, that they were being taken care of but they they were forgotten and so they're no longer forgotten so they're you know they're uh they're getting some now it's not what we'd like but we we do we do uh hope people will will see that uh that this uh, podcast is supporting them and if you go on there and like and subscribe it's going to help because we get money not only from donations but the, from the subscriptions and we don't have near enough subscriptions to to you know, get them what we would like to get them. So um, you guys like and subscribe. Go ahead, Mark. Well, one thing is, for the first 20 years, there was not social media. So it really didn't come up that much. And I'm sure some of us had some problems or dealing with it. As time gone on, I've been a survivor for 46 years. I'm used to it. I, I don't mind telling somebody, it's, if, People, most people you meet that are just curious about one thing. I've been asked every question. You can be asked about it over a hundred times. So I don't mind doing that. I now, I'll have problems if I spend too much time online on Facebook, and it's always about Skinner or whatever. 
So that's the reason why I don't get on too much. But people are just curious. If you're a real fan, they will ask you. They're always very respectful. That's one of those things that you cannot get your brain around unless you've been on. So I don't have a problem with that. Then another thing that uh, Mark did, and um, and I give him great credit for it, is he kind of like got the survivors back together with the first responders and those guys have just turned into a huge big family you know uh they uh they've got the monument there and and if it weren't for mark uh you know it 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 probably wouldn't have happened uh so uh you know mark was instrumental in that and and we got some cool stuff coming up you're gonna make it out of the monument in october yeah. mark i'm not gonna be able to be part <clears throat> of the love train starting out in Cleveland, but I'll catch y'all somewhere down there. Yeah, because yeah, uh, I leave you in Spartanburg and trying to catch you, Craig, coming down from uh, Ohio, it will add a whole lot of mileage where I can meet you down the hill. Yeah, that would be great. And it's it's going to be a really great time. I'm going to uh, get in touch with uh, Dwayne Easley. Uh, I've been been meaning to give him a call Dwayne. if you're listening man i'm going to give you a call because we want to kind of zero in on the events that's going to be happening in october october 20th time frame and kind of let everybody know a little bit more about the specifics uh i i know one of the things that's going to be really cool is uh james hughes he's got a bunch of air airplane parts that came from the wreckage that is going to be on display and uh We'll get you specifics exactly where that's going to be. It's going to be like at a bed and breakfast house or something. It's going to be a nice place. And he told me to tell everybody, uh, don't forget to bring cash because there's going to be, uh, there's going to be some donations and things and you won't be able to do it with a credit card. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we'll remind everybody about that. And, uh, it's going to be a great time. Of course, Craig's going to, do the convoy from his house. And, uh, there's, I think, believe it, there's another convoy coming up from Jacksonville. Uh, so there's, there's two convoys that I know of that, uh, people can participate in and you get your CB radio. And I think Craig, don't you have a, did you get a couple, uh, donated CB radios yet? I haven't got them yet. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a contacted guy. Mm-hmm. We're in, yeah, we're in communication. I just haven't gotten them yet. I, I'll send him my FedEx number and he can send them to me. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we can give those away or something, you know, to some of the people that need them. But, uh, but I've yeah, couple, so I've got three handhelds too. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so that's going to kind of be like Smokey and the Bandit, you know, a little bit like that. You know, it's going to be kind of fun. But, uh, that monument, that's a, a really great thing. You know, if you guys, uh, haven't seen it yet and Gillsburg, you know, they've got, don't they have one, they've got one at the hospital too, right, Mark? They've got some. I didn't go by there when, you know, I knew it was there. I will this last time, this next time. Last time I went down was, you know, when they did the monument and then, dedication but when i left that day uh to come back home we were kind of ready to come back you know this this whole uh podcast what we like to do is we we like to gear it towards we call skin formation but you know every now and then we got to pay the bills and we got to make sure that the survivors are being taken care of but uh you know just to be fair and for for some people that are looking for skin information let's ask mark mark what what was it like to be artemis piles drum tech it was different it's new i've known artemis so long yeah now that really was yeah so the, all the working with skinner was new to me i never had done it and i think really the plane crash kind of kept me into the music business but let me back up. I mean, this is back when Skinner, you know, was Skinner. <laughs> There's still a lot of, you know, drinking and drugging and whatever. Not, you know, typical Southern rock. And so, I mean, all of this is good to work for. Everybody was. But like I said, it was kind of new to me. Uh, but one thing, you know, sort of leaving 
Artemis Pyle is the only person I know that was willing to take that drumming job with Skinner on a full-time basis, knowing it was not going to be a cakewalk. <laughs> you know, I mean, he had taken it for a long haul, and he was a good drummer. Yeah, uh, he fit right in with Skinner. What were some of the challenges of like setting his drums up and things like that? Was it, uh, it couldn't have been always easy, you know? Not that bad. I had to do it for a while. And, uh, but actually, what had, what was really nice about the tour of survivors, and I think Craig kind of designed the, the uh, drum riser with the speakers. And I think Joe Osborne kind of put it together. But that made it much easier, and it was actually probably the nicest drum riser and monitor system that was out on the road at that time. Um, about that. Do you stay in touch with Artemis? <clears throat> no, I mean, don't, it's not that often, and the only reason why I don't is just life kind of has moved on. You know, uh, if I want to go see him, I can get my car and drive up to Morganton and uh, but the last time I talked to him was a friend of mine, Mark Higgins, from Michigan, had purchased a uh, promo copy of uh, One More From the Road. And Artemis' signature was in a different way. Sometimes he used Tommy. So he sent me that, and I texted Artemis, you know, asked him, you know, was this his signature? And, you know, he got back with me and said, yeah. Yeah, he was just verifying that signature for Mark on the album because it was going to be kind of pricey. Yeah. Now, a lot of people don't realize that that Mark was was actually good friends with the Caldwells and Marshall Tucker Band, and he grew you grew up in the same town, isn't that correct, Mark? Spartanburg. Actually, yeah. I could walk from here where I live to where Tommy had his wreck. You know. And the first concert, our first Skinner concert I went to was in Hickory, North Carolina. And, but Tucker and Skinner both put out their first albums almost just a couple of weeks apart, or maybe a month. So it was early 74. Skinner had not come out with Sweet Home Alabama yet. But anyway, uh, first time I ever saw him was at Lenore Ryan in Hickory, North Carolina. Yeah. So Artemis knew him as well, isn't that correct, Mark? And he Artemis. was from the same area? No. Artemis no. was stationed in, in uh, Paris Island, and he was kind of finishing up four years of you know, commitment to the Marines. He started dating my next-door neighbor, Pat. She had graduated high school with Toy Caldwell. So once they got married and they moved to Columbus, Tucker came through. And Pat called Toy, and her and Artemis went to, you know, catch uh, Marshall Tucker. So at that time, you know, there was, Spartanburg was pretty good music wise for being a small town. You know, Tucker was doing good, Skinner was doing good. So that's what brought, you know, Artemis and Pat back to Spartanburg. And that's when I really got to know Artemis. And it was through Tommy, I think it was more to do with Paul T. Riddle, because I remember Artemis saying that he reinduced himself to Paul. And through Tucker, they, well, Charlie Daniels and Tucker played a lot together. So I just kind of worked its way through. Yeah, it's part of the business. You know, most businesses, and especially business, music business, it's based on context and people know. Uh, I think, uh, uh, I believe Artemis was like kind of like infatuated with trying to get become uh, um, a drummer uh, for Charlie Daniels, wasn't he? I, I heard he had his drums loaded in a Volkswagen and he used to follow him around trying to get him to let him play. Is that is some, the truth to that? Well, what I'm talking is, I know, well, actually, Artemis and Sonny Matheny, which, you know, Craig 
Oh, oh yeah, I remember Sonny, Big Sonny. Yeah, yeah. he was yeah. a linebacker for Tennessee Tech. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if it was the same one, but anyway, they went down to the warehouse in New Orleans, and I don't know if Artemis actually did the audition. It seemed like he recently. Charlie had told him that he, you know, was going to stay with what drummers he had. But Charlie's the one that directed Artemis to Skinner. And yeah, I guess uh, when Ronnie, like when they had the problem with Bob Burns and Ronnie needed a drummer, and I guess he asked Charlie Daniels and he said, I got the guy for you, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty much. And then Artemis, and that when Artemis flew over to Europe, Craig? Yeah, and, yeah, uh, he did. Yep. Yeah. That was kind of a weird time because he had to learn Bob's parts and Bob was a little we crazy. had to hide. We had to hide. We didn't Bob didn't know that Artemis was a drummer. He was just hanging. Artemis was just hang, hanging. Oh, really? around. And we yeah, we had to hide the fact that Artemis was a drummer and Bob was just hanging around. But yeah. <laughs> didn't you have to fly back with uh Bob Me Burns? Me and Bob, me and Joe, Joe Barnes and Bob Burns, have, yeah, flew back on the plane. And that was weird because Bob fired me because he said I was the devil. <laughs> well, that was wrong. when, that was when he was all freaked out with the exorcist thing, you know. And uh, did he know that Artemis took his place on the way back on that trip back with you and? Joe Barnes, did he know he was? No, he had Artemis hadn't taken his place, but at that time, Artemis just came over there and just kind of met with uh, uh, Ronnie and everybody and just kind of hung out. And uh, yeah, they didn't tell uh, Bob, do knew nothing about it. And then when we got back, that's when Artemis became part of the picture, from what I remember. And now Mark Frank, now Mark's a drummer in his own right. And even though he's had a stroke, I've heard him play his drums. And to me, I mean, I'm sure Mark would say that, you know, he he's probably not as good as he used to be or whatever, but it sounds pretty daggone good to me, Mark. Uh, you know, where did you, when, when did you start playing drums? I just had always had a set, you know, uh, and God, I hadn't played in 20 some years. Then I had my stroke. And my neurologist thought it would be something good to take up. So I just started you know, playing again. And But never really kind of pursued it. You know, decent drummer. I'm actually not a bad guitarist. I'm fair, put it that way. I can play one, four, five, three chord rock and roll. But. It, weren't you like in one of the Caldwell's weddings or something? I think it seemed like you told me about that or Artemis. something. I was at Artemis's wedding. Artemis wedding. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so you met the Caldwell's before Artemis then, correct? Oh, I've known Tucker, you know, all the players and Tucker's from God, I remember back when they were part of them were a soul band, the new generation. Then they became the Rants or A N T the and then after that, it was the Toy Factory. That's when most of uh, March Tucker or Vietnam Veteran. I mean, Toy Cowboy was a purple heart. He was a Marine, right? Yeah. Doug Gray, he was a U.S. Army Vietnam Veteran. He was over there during Tet. Uh, Tommy was a, a Marine but because he had bursitis. You know, he got an early out. George McCorkle was, you know, U.S. Navy, and I'm not sure if he went to the Bay of Tonkin or Sea of Tonkin, that which makes him a Vietnam veteran, but the road crew, <coughs> that was almost a Vietnam veteran, you know, so, and actually, Tucker was asked to play, I can't say if it was in the Annapolis, but it was a prestigious military um, event, but they were asked to play there just on the strength of the commitment of their country. Did you ever do anything with Marshall Tucker as far as help him out road crew wise or anything? You were Never just did. friends with him, Craig. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, you, you did. It I was with the, Yeah, I was with the new Marshall Tucker. I never worked for. 
Toy or, or Paul Riddle or or none of those people. I just worked for Jerry U. When I was with them, it was just Jerry Eubanks and Doug Gray, and, they, and that was all the original. Ace Allen. Ace Allen was a drummer. Uh, no, uh, Dave, David Allen was the drummer when I... Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's what we call him, Ace Allen. And Stuart Swan. A Ace Allen, yeah. <laughs> and, and Stuart, yeah, Stuart passed away. And Rusty Milner. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Mark, let's go back to the time when uh, when you got offered the position to be Artemis's drum tech. And, you know, you knew you were going to be working with Skinner and Artemis. How did that come about? Actually, uh, once Artemis joined Skinner, you know, I met uh, Leon over at his house, you know, when they were in town or if he was out, in other words, <laughs> if they were playing close, let me back up a little bit. I met Dean over there a couple times and this is where I went to work with Skinner. And Leon, I remember the first time I met Leon. And this is when they fired so and so. It's back when Skinner got rid of the road. And I, but I almost met the thing Kilpatrick was going, why don't you call Mark? You know. So that's really kind of how I got into it. It was just real fast, real quick. And, but I didn't stay for a couple of days because I wasn't sure if I could work with Skinner. I mean, really intriguing. Skinner was a tough gig for the plane crash, to just that way. And, uh, yeah. So I kind of made up some kind of bullshit come, you know, reason not to go back out and thought I had lost the gig. And they had called Raymond. Raymond Watkins came in. Somebody else quit. I think I got rid of David St. John. So there for a little while, they were sort of like, Brody's going in and out, in and out, you know. And then finally, uh, <clears throat> uh, on the British Road, that turned out, you know, to be kind of strange. Uh oh. You know. Yeah, so did you know that in 2004? Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Mark. <clears throat> But on British Road, I mean, uh, Craig, my, why we got thrown out of the Westmoreland and had to go to the Lancaster was because it was a big old fight. I'm kind of just rambling right now. What I'm saying is just, I did the uh, on the British Road tour and did a lot of the California days. But actually, the tour of the Survivor was going to be my big tour with Skinner. Um, you know, it was going to be you know, full time on the last five days. Going back to before the plane crash, you know, and some of the gigs that you worked, um, what were, was there anything in particular that uh, was like a challenge working with Leonard Skinner or Ronnie or anything that you can think of? Uh, have any experiences with Ronnie that you can share? No, uh, Actually, it was new, so, you know, there's some things that I wasn't comfortable about. Actually, moving around on stage or behind the amp line, you know, I mean, there's some things you can do to screw up a gig, or, if, you know, I kind of sat back. I mean, Chuck Flowers was there, uh, Craig, but, you know, I did, didn't do anything more than what I had to, not because I was lazy, just I didn't want to screw anything up. Right. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, Ronnie could be pretty particular, so especially with his mom. Well, you, and, you weren't in the meeting. You weren't in the meeting with this when Chuck and Raymond quit then. No, that's <laughs> how I got back in full time. Yeah, see, I don't, re I don't remember some of that. Um, I don't remember you being with, with, with us when Chuck and Raymond were uh, – we're in the we're in the band, yes. Because that that's when I became the drum roadie, and uh, that's when I became the guitar. Uh, dr that's when I became the guitar tech and the drum roadie. <laughs> and then and then we we finished that tour, 
And then, and then I thought that's when you came in. I know, yeah. I, uh, it seems like the tour of survivors is really when I started back again. But no, I know I did Anaheim and then uh, went to Sur Productions, you know, did some rehearsal out in California, you know, Oakland, and had some time off. And then, like I said, now I'm going back, I'm getting a little bit confused on it. Uh, I don't know. Ask me another question. <laughs> So after that was, the, you know, that was forty five years yeah, ago. I get right. I get confused myself. <laughs> as but, to, you know, you talking know, to talking to Mark, man, he's got a great memory. I mean, I you know, especially uh, like if you go back to podcast fourteen and he describes everything on the plane and stuff. You guys go check that out. It's really interesting. But so after the crash, Mark, what what did you do? Uh, what was what what did you do after that? After you, how long did it take for you to heal up? Uh, probably took me eight weeks, nine weeks before I could really get out and stay up on my feet all day. <coughs> uh, it's just kind of slow going, you know. It's, but I tell you what, it was the best sleep I ever had in my life. In other words, once you had shock, and it's almost like shock will drain energy from you. It's almost like if you had a valve on your ankle. And you opened it up and you let all the air out of you, which would be shock. It takes a long time for it to build up. When I got back home for the first couple of weeks, I could lay down, close my eyes, and sleep for eight, 10, 12 hours, not move, not remember any of it. And it's just a slow process of building back up energy. It takes that long. Yeah, yeah I think it's. Yeah. I tell ahead, people Chris. that that uh, a after the crash, I was I was back to work uh, just in a few months, but I was in shock for at least ten years after that plane crash. I, I you know, your body just is in shock. You don't really realize it, but you know, now I realize it. You know that you know I was I was pretty messed up for at least one decade. <laughs> Where are you going? Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, Artemis had a hard time with it. Everybody saying, you know, Artemis, I mean, Artemis is a very self-assured person. He's got all the confidence in the world. But there were a few things he did. And for years, you know, everybody assumed it was sort of a cakewalk for Artemis. The last time we talked, uh, we got He was talking. probably the least hurt, wasn't he, Artemis? Yeah, yeah, take me on that. But he said everything good in his life he lost because of plane crash. Now he knew my parents. And there was one night, it was probably three, four months after the crash, that he kind of stopped in and saw my parents and started tearing up, crying some, which is not a put down. But <laughs> by after about four or five months, most people are sort of kind of get on with their lives. I didn't think anything about it. But once we had a conversation a couple of years ago and he was telling me how, how how hard of a time he had with it, that kind of clicked, you know. Uh things were not good for him, you know. Uh because he did see a lot. I mean he was uh very elusive. I mean he knew exactly what he was doing, so he did go back down a plane crash. <clears throat> now, how much he did, I don't know. But I mean he knew exactly what was going on. I mean he never lost consciousness and he walked up to the uh, to the cockpit, you know, pilots, you know, saw them. They were, he knew they were deceased. So, so after you uh you said it was like about eight weeks or whatever and just you know, of course, that was a long time ago until now. What's kind of some of the stuff that you did for an income, you know, as far as working up until now? Well, I'm ready. Uh, uh, I think I got, I think we were, I, I got $95 a week for ours was a worker's comp. Yeah. So, I mean, I got that started. And I lived off that $95 a week for a long time. 
and kind of just creep back into work. You know, I probably can't tell you now exactly what I did, you know, or what I did for, you know, conversation work wise, but I kid down the road. I just have to mm-hmm. think about it. Now you're uh, you're a big advocate for for people that have had strokes, and uh, we were talking a little bit earlier, and it you know just because of your your passion for that and stuff. Uh, so what what are some of the things you need to look out for if you're prone to a stroke? There, um, well, it's not that if you go to your doctor and that's about three or four visit, he keeps saying you to get your cholesterol uh, under control. He's trying to take you to, he's trying to tell you something. You know, don't take it lightly. Some people are just predispositioned to going to have them. Uh, you know, our American diet sucks. But the other thing about it is, really, if you think you're having a stroke, don't be ish. Don't try to talk yourself out of it. You know, and the best way, you never drive yourself down to the emergency room. Yeah, you know, the quickest way to get into the ER is the EMT. And, you know, my biggest thing, I said earlier, is have, being able to recognize someone around you, a loved one, you know, is having a stroke, you know, because they will not be able to tell you. And that goes back to that past. Are there, like, any organizations <laughs> that... Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. That you're familiar with, that people can get help that have had to deal with that. Well, there's some good places on uh, uh, Facebook, yeah, you know, that are good. Yeah, you know, people have just had them and they just want information. But folks with strokes, is whenever I can bump into somebody who's just recently had a stroke, yeah, you know, I'm not a doctor. I can't give them, you know, any medical advice. But a lot of times, they're just hungry for information sort of what to expect, you know, or I might tell them, well, this worked for me or that worked for you. And it's really just kind of putting it on a personal level where they can pick up and talk to somebody. Do you feel like the plane crash had any contribution towards the stroke at all? Nah, it was too too far gone. Yeah. And I was just, you know, cholesterol. For some reason, cholesterol I had was sort of like cottage cheese in my artery right here. It was only like 55, 60% uh, blockage, but it broke off very easy. So, I mean, I really didn't have any, you know, my doctor said, you know, schedule surgery. And I, I, I was always phobic about being put under, you know, but he just explained to me if he does nothing, go in it. If he wasn't, if I didn't allow him to do the operation, that I was going to have a massive stroke. So. And Paul Welch, he had a stroke too, you said? Did he? Yeah. He I did? Exactly, well, yeah. So that's one thing you guys have in common there, you know. At, uh, Thank you. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, you know, you guys, you got a little history there, Mark Frank, and, you know, we appreciate Mark coming on here and, and, and talking about, you know, his, uh, his, uh, receiving the, uh, funds and how appreciative he is of it. And, um, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of hard for Mark to get on, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, he's, he's, uh, living in an assisted living facility there and, you know, and he's, you know, he, he doesn't like to talk too much about that plane crash, but God bless him. He'll do it sometimes. And I know, uh, Mark and I, you know, we, we talked a little bit about, uh, on the phone because I'm an aircraft mechanic. And I think that's how we got hooked up as you were kind of asking me a little mm-hmm. bit about the engine, the wasp engine. And, you know, you kind of saw something that a lot of people, other people didn't see, like, you know, this, this trail of fuel coming out of the, uh, out of the engine and uh that's kind of like bothered you for a long time because you you were trying to figure out why that was doing that but uh and then uh, the fuel that i saw was come out of future lot and uh, that might be good another good story down the road right uh 
Well, I think we probably got just about everything we can out of you, Mark. And we appreciate you coming on, Craig. Uh, yeah, we want to have you on again, know? Mark. We want to have you on again here in the next, you know, 10 or 20 more episodes or whatever, you know. Yeah, we got, always. We, always. We, got a, we got a lot of people coming up here in the, in, in the near future. But, yeah, we want to have you on and, what about uh, again. Say you know. again, Mark. What about getting Derek S. on? Because I, I have asked Derek to come on, and he he just kind of goes, you know, I I just I don't have really have anything to contribute. I you know I I play locally in some in some local bands around town, and he just doesn't feel like he he's uh, a qual admirable or qualified to come on or whatever. But you know I you know he. We he, he he was in that project with for rocking for a reason. I don't know. Maybe if we can, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that that if something comes up where that that little thing gets a little little juice behind it, maybe we can get him to come on. But we, I'd love to have Derek come on. Yeah, that'd be great. I tell you what would what would be great is. Go ahead, Mark. Go ahead. Because I'd like to hear some information about Rosins and Collins, how it was. The right. Tour, yeah. Because you know, I thought that was a damn good band. I tell you the truth, one It was a great. Rosins and Collins was a great band. We'd like, we'd like to. That's what we'd like to have him come on and just give his take of. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people like to. He just he doesn't think he's he's kind of like me. I, I there's things that I Griff asked me, and he goes. God, that's so cool. He said, why you have you asked me before? I goes, it ain't nothing to me. You know, it's just, you mm -hmm. know, it's just, you know, and stuff that doesn't mean anything to me means, you know, you tell people and they go, wow, that's cool. And that's kind of where Derek's at. You know, he thinks that some of the information that he has, you know, wouldn't be uh, uh, worthwhile repeating or whatever, but he's, you know, sadly mistaken. You know, mm -hmm. we'd love to have him call and talk and, you know, all those Ross and Dick Collins people, you know, that was a, that was a great band, yeah. and I, I still listen to that stuff. Yeah. Actually, because uh, what has gone through my mind was, okay, here you are in Ross and Dick Collins. He's playing on a world stage. Got a good band, and I assumed hoping it was going to last for a long time to have such a good band to last just such a short time. Yeah, well, that's yeah. got to be something to get over. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah. Well, exactly. As far as Derek Hess, uh, there's a character out there named Jimmy Withers, and uh, <clears throat> he's kind of like friends with Derek, really good friends with Derek, and really good mm -hmm. friends with Gene Odom. And uh, he's got uh, what he calls the porch of doom at his house. And, you know, they kind of sit out there and drink beer and bullshit and, you know, uh and he's uh, he's invited me to come on the porch of doom maybe uh we can get him to get Derek out there and i'll do a little on the road with him and video and you know ask him some questions so we'll mm -hmm. try that you know all right well look i'm gonna let you go i'll be on two hours <laughs> anyway i appreciate it and like i said to all the donors out there uh, thank you so much thank you we appreciate you coming well, gonna, on, Mark. Hey, Mark, we're going to close up the show anyway, so why don't you just hang out? We're going to aren't we going to close it out here, Griff? Or yeah, let me just say one more thing: is uh, it, Craig uh, got in touch with uh, uh, Kurt Custer, and uh, he gave me a phone call last night, and I I think I was on the phone with him for two hours. You know what a talented guy, what a really cool guy, um, and he's coming on next Wednesday. Uh, you know, uh, so we're going to have him on as a guest. He's got a lot of great stories. And so you guys, uh, you know, you're going to want to look out for Kurt Custer coming on. Um, I think you're going to love some of these stories. He told me a few last night. And whenever I like do a, a pre-interview with people before they come on the podcast, I try not to ask too many questions. I like to save it for the podcast because it has a better impact, but you know, I told him, I said, maybe we better not talk anymore. And then, you know, he'd come up with another story and I'd be like riveted to it. So, you know, we went over a lot of stuff last, last night. So I think you guys are going to really enjoy Kurt Custer coming on. So, so yeah, that well, being said. Yeah. One other thing too, 
because of my struggle, I, I lose words. Uh, some of these little stories that started out this way went that way. It happens. <laughs> I'm doing the best <laughs> I can do. It happens with me, too. <laughs> You're doing fine, oh, Mark. You did a great job, man. Great job. We, That's we all I got, got Greg. We, we both got a little brain damage. <laughs> yeah. All right. This is, this, is, this is podcast 93 of the Stone Roadie Show. And happy trails to you until we meet again. And uh, happy nice. trails. May the good Lord keep, take a liking to you. Keep rolling into you then. And uh, may the good Lord take a liking to you. And this is podcast 93. And cut. Thank you, Mark. Folks with strokes, appreciate you.